Rekat structure is a giant formation in the Sahara that looks exactly like a giant bullseye. It's so wide that you can see it from space. Even the CIA got interested in it. In 1965, they planned a flyover looking for geomagnetic anomalies. The findings are still classified. Perhaps the theories are true. And this place is truly the lost city of Atlantis. Now, Atlantis supposedly sank beneath the waves. But recent discoveries are pointing us in a different direction. This is an ancient story that goes far back in time, and Plato was the first to mention it. The place had loads of greenery and a curious structure. Three concentric circles of land surrounding two circles of water. Two key quotes from Plato's writing suggest that Atlantis might not have been a typical island in the middle of the ocean. Plus, Atlantis had a major influence from Africa and Europe, challenging the idea of it being in the Atlantic. It turns out that the Eye of the Sahara and Atlantis look alike. When astronauts saw the Eye of Sahara from above, they initially suspected a meteorite impact crater. But the rings of the structure matched the layout described of Atlantis. More importantly, the Sahara wasn't always a desert. It turned from a tropical region into a desert around 11,000 years ago. Researchers found evidence of a massive river called the Tamarasset that could have sustained a community. This river flowed toward the Rikat structure, aligning with Plato's description. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran through the Sahara 50 to 100 million years ago. The sea allegedly destroyed Atlantis around 11,500 years ago, likely due to a rapid rise in sea level caused by the end of the Ice Age. NASA's worldview imagery shows patterns consistent with this theory. Those concentric rings might be a key to unlocking the secrets of our planet's evolution over millions of years. They're shaped by erosion on resilient rock layers, creating a spooky pattern of ridges and troughs. The central peak stands proud at 1,300 feet. The central part has undergone a significant erosion makeover, revealing a circular structure with a raised peak. Unlike impact craters, the eye of the Sahara flaunts a striking balance and symmetry. Some say it results from rock uplift, sculpted by wind and water. Others think it's an ancient anticline, eroded to reveal its concentric glory. Then there's a salt diapir theory, suggesting that salt's buoyancy sculpted this beauty. Dating techniques have proved that it formed 541 to 252 million years ago, give or take a million or two. Ancient tools are scattered around the outer rings of the structure near riverbeds. Some older stone tools have also been spotted in the same areas. And still, even though some spear points from the Neolithic period have been found, there aren't many signs that people were living there back then. The area seems to have been used for short-term activities like hunting and making tools. There are other unearthly mysteries that haunt our world. One such enigma is in Norway. The ominous Hestalen light phenomenon, also known as the Valley of Lights, leaves scientists confused. This valley is 10 miles wide. It's quite isolated, but a peculiar blue box sits high on the hillside, equipped with cameras scanning the valley. The unsettling saga began in the 1980s, when the night sky over Hestalen erupted with burning fireballs, a recurring spectacle that sent shivers down the spines of those who witnessed it. This wasn't a fleeting occurrence. Rather, it became a regular thing. Terrified locals reported encounters with these unexplained luminous phenomena, some of which happened near their homes. Unease spread like wildfire. At its peak, there were about 20 sightings every week. The phenomenon made its way into newspapers, magazines, and media worldwide. Soon, people flocked to the valley, hoping to see the lights themselves. In 1984, experts joined the fray, armed with sophisticated instruments like magnetometers, radiometers, and other ometers. What they encountered was mind-bending, lights that defied explanation. Some moved at a leisurely pace, while others raced through the sky at an astonishing 19,000 miles per hour. People tried to explain these lights. Airplanes, distant reflections, ball lightning, satellites, planets, meteors. But the speed and how these lights danced ruled out all those theories. We're slowly approaching another mysterious place. This is the greatest subglacial lake among Antarctica's 675 known lakes. It can easily hide unknown life forms. This lake is beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. 
Dive about two and a half miles under the ice, and there you'll see Lake Vashtak, located at 1,600 feet below sea level. This lake is 155 miles long and 31 miles wide at its broadest point. With an average depth of 1,400 feet, it's also the world's sixth largest by volume. It's like an underwater city with lofty pillars and deep basins. The secret lake was discovered in 1993, yet it had been waiting to be found down there for over 2,000 years, collecting ancient secrets. In 2012, scientists drilled through the ice, creating the longest ice core ever. They pierced the ice all the way to the lake surface. The year 2013 brought an unexpected twist when the tranquil waters erupted during the extraction of an ice core, mixing with drilling fluids. Then they got a pristine water sample in 2015. Some believe there might be previously unknown life forms down there, since it's a fossil water reserve that's been untouched for millions of years. They could be a lot like those speculated ice-covered oceans on moons like Europa and Enceladus. It all started with a theory in the 19th century, suggesting fresh water lurking under Antarctic ice sheets. Then, in 1955, seismic soundings hinted at a subglacial lake. And by the 90s, satellite data confirmed Lake Vashtok's existence. Now, Lake Vashtok isn't alone. In 2005, they found an island in the middle of the lake. Then, two smaller lakes joined the party. They suspect that a secret network of subglacial rivers might link these lakes. Now, very far away from Antarctica, in Venezuela, Catatumbo lightning presents a sinister light show at the junction of the Catatumbo River and Lake Maracaibo. This unsettling lightning phenomenon happens at about 140 to 160 nights a year, going on for 10 hours a day, and can flash up to 280 times in a single hour. The frequency of this lightning show changes with the seasons and from year to year. There was a break between January to March in 2010, causing a bit of worry that it might vanish forever. As the sun sets, winds from the east start picking up speed. This strong wind is called a nocturnal low-level jet, like what you see in the Great Plains of North America. These winds bring moisture, mostly from the Caribbean and the lake itself. This humid air hits high mountain ridges, causing thunderstorms to form over the mountains. Thanks to the ongoing wind situation, more thunderstorms appear as the night goes on. This pattern repeats itself, and is why this area has the highest annual lightning rate globally. The next place scientists cannot explain is in China. That is the Longyu Caves. They have lofty slanted roofs and sturdy pillars. This spot remained hidden for centuries. These human-made caverns, built around 2,000 years ago, decided to reveal themselves only in the 90s. Local farmers drained some ponds and unveiled five massive caverns. Further digging exposed an additional 19 smaller caves. They range from 60 to 110 feet in width and 26 to 50 feet in height. Archaeologists found historical relics from the reign of Emperor Zhuan of Han, dating back to over 2,000 years ago. Now, how did these caves survive for more than two millennia without falling apart? No ancient records explain the way they were crafted either. The walls show chisel marks, hinting at some layer-by-layer -layer chiseling action, but the exact construction process is still a head-scratcher. Oh, gravity, you heartless so-and-so. Well, that's what I think when I trip over a stone and fall face down. Of course, I'm not clumsy, you know. Anyway, gravity is a constant, right? Something entirely unshakable that we can always rely on in this ever-changing world. Unlike, you know, love. Feeling romantic, sorry. But what if I told you that it's not as honest and clear as you think? There are places on our planet where gravity behaves like it's gone crazy. And that's why you clicked here. So let's take a look. Magnetic Hill in Leh, India There's a stretch of road in India that's been attracting tourists from all over the world. It's no different looking from the surrounding landscape, and you could easily pass it by without noticing, if not for one very unusual and a bit creepy thing. If you stop your car on the magnetic hill going up the slope and put it on neutral, it'll start crawling upwards, eventually reaching the speed of up to 12 miles per hour. They say there's some sort of magnetic force at work here 
that tugs cars up the hill, hence the name. On top of that, even airplanes are said to gain altitude above this place. Skeptics offer another explanation, though. It's just the lay of the land that creates an illusion of going upwards, while in fact, you're moving down the hill and vice versa. Whatever the truth, I'd like to see it for myself. Would you? Tell me down in the comments. The Crooked Forest, Poland Near the village of Nova Tarnovo, there's a forest in the depth of which you can find a strangely looking pine tree. Planted in the 1930s, there are 400 trees that sharply twist to the north, almost at the roots, and then grow upwards in a semicircle. Although scientists offer different theories about the tree's weird growth, nobody can say for sure what made them look like that. Some say it's people who did it, while others believe it's a gravitational anomaly that somehow pushed the trees down. The trouble with this version, though, is that it would have had to stay there for years, and that only affected the trees. Still, no certain explanation exists anyways, so who knows? A waterfall, Faroe Islands. Ever seen an upward-moving waterfall? You can have a look at one on the Faroe Islands, halfway from Iceland to Scotland. But if you were expecting me to tell you an unbelievable story about a mysterious force pushing the water up the rock, then sorry, no such thing here. The truth, however, is quite jaw-dropping anyway. The winds in this place are so powerful that they lift the water and throw it back up. I guess it was this kind of wind that allowed Mary Poppins to travel on her umbrella. Sounds good. In fact, this waterfall is not unique. There are several more places on Earth where winds create an illusion of defied gravity. For example, there's the Kinder River in England that has a waterfall constantly struggling with the wind. It's so strong that half of the Cascades' water seems to just fly up without ever touching the bottom of the drop. Hoover Dam in Nevada, USA If you ever get up to the top of the dam, which is about 726 feet high, you can try a little trick. Take a bottle of water and pour it over the edge. You'll see the water flow up instead of spilling down. Once again, this isn't really any magic or unnatural phenomenon. The wind up here is simply too strong for the water to fall, just like with the waterfall on the Faroe Islands. Here, though, it looks even more impressive, since you can do it yourself. Dokapi Road, South Korea Another gravitational anomaly located on a road. Locals once found out that if you put an empty can or a bottle on the ground, it will immediately start rolling uphill. Unlike other such places in the world, though, Dokabi Road doesn't just create an illusion. When you walk down the slope, you don't feel as if you're going up. Everything's pretty normal. But once you put down an object that can roll, it will do that in the opposite direction than it should. Local authorities were quick to get the idea and put a signpost directing curious tourists to the mysterious road. Golden Rock, Burma If you happen to be in Burma, these days it's also called Myanmar, make sure to visit this well-known site. A gold-leaf-covered boulder sits upon the edge of a cliff, and a small pagoda is built on top of it. The impressive thing about the rock is that it only lightly touches the cliff for support. In fact, it looks like the boulder will fall any minute now, but it has been standing like that for centuries. On top of that, the pagoda built upon it is not really a recent addition, so it's quite an unusual sight to see. The rock seems to be saying, gravity? Hmm, I don't care about that stuff. The legend has it that what keeps the boulder in place is a single strand of Buddha's hair. Well, I don't know about that, but you can check out the rock for yourself and see that it's not attached to the cliff by anything. And yet, it's not budged for 2,500 years. Something must be at work here, huh? Stone of Davasco, Argentina If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the Stone of Davasco. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately, today you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, 
the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people in the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. Well, not exactly put it together chip by chip, they made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Devil's Tower in Wyoming, USA Remember this place from the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind? If not, you should go watch it, but not right now. This place doesn't make you feel like you're witnessing some magic and doesn't really trick gravity right before your eyes. Sounds almost boring compared with the rest of the sites on my list, right? But the true, mind-blowing feature of Devil's Tower is that scientists can't explain how it came to existence in the first place. You see, it's an 867-foot rock formation with walls so steep they're basically vertical. But that isn't even the main thing. This piece of stone just rose amid rolling plains of Wyoming with nothing like it for miles and miles around. So how is it that such a flat landscape could have suddenly given birth to something so tall? Theories abound, but nobody has the answer yet. My theory? Well, perhaps here is where the Earth has a giant Audi belly button. Well then, you come up with a better theory. Oregon Vortex, USA the House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. And there's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in this shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoided approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet. And voila, a perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity, a human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes in other senses. Hudson Bay, Canada Okay, we've talked about some pretty ambiguous stuff. But now it's time for the real deal, the Hudson Bay Anomaly. This is probably the only place in the world where gravity is indeed lower than anywhere else on the planet. Even skeptics can't smirk at it because the difference has been measured with precision equipment. So does it mean that the gravity here is as low as, say, on the moon then? Unfortunately, or is it luckily, I'm not sure yet, the difference is minuscule. The exact value is 0.005%, or 1 200th of a percent. You won't be able to feel it even if you try your hardest, but it's still there. Scientists say this anomaly exists because of the ice sheet that covered the area about 10,000 years ago. It compressed the rock so much that they still can't fully recover, shifting the gravitational field in Hudson Bay. Sometime in the future, though, the gravity will return to normal in this area as well. No moonwalk for me, then. How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. 
Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much, just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T-Rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. 
Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in freefall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Waskaru in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. I'm about to introduce you to a place where the laws of physics take a vacation. Welcome to the mystery spot where you can witness all kinds of implausible things that will leave you scratching your head in disbelief. Don't worry, it's not sorcery or witchcraft. It's just some clever optical illusions that mess with your brain and make you question reality. Back in the day when the Great Depression was hitting hard, people needed some fun distractions. That's how the entertainment industry gave birth to the concept of mystery spots. One of the most famous mystery spots is the one near Santa Cruz, California. The name is all intrigue and mystique, isn't it? Once you step inside, you'll see people standing upright on a slanted floor or at impossible angles on a flat surface. You'll see a ball rolling up a ramp defying gravity and logic. It's like being in a fun house, but without creepy clowns. The site is known for its gravity-defying demonstrations, which appear to bend the laws of physics, both on the short uphill walk and inside the wooden building on the site. Misperceptions of the height and orientation of objects occur here. These visual illusions include balls rolling uphill and people leaning farther than normally possible without falling down. Psychologists at Berkeley state that all of the misperceptions stem from the simple fact that the house is slanted at a 20 degree angle. The next stop is again in the USA, but this time at Hoover Dam in Nevada. Here gravity seems to play with us too. Try this experiment if you ever happen to go there. Pour water from a bottle over the dam. You will witness that instead of going down, the water will start flowing upward. The reason behind this is a very powerful updraft that the structure of the dam creates. In other words, the water gets carried upward by the wind. This trick is not unique to the dam, as there's a reverse waterfall in the Faroe Islands. It occurs due to a wild weather phenomenon known as an inverted waterfall. Imagine a gigantic whirlwind of ocean spray swirling up a steep, 1,542 fought high rocky cliff. So how does this crazy phenomenon happen, you ask? Well, it's all thanks to a spiral column of air that rotates near high and steep cliffs, creating a mini tornado effect. And when the wind hits the edge of the cliff, it gets even stronger and picks up coastal water, which then splashes up the cliff and creates a massive water and wind funnel. Apparently these inverted waterfalls can happen in other places too, 
Like on the cliffs of Mohair in Ireland, the mountains of Iceland, and even in the Waipuhia Falls of Hawaii. Talk about Mother Nature showing off her skills. Ah, magnetic hill in Lodak, India? The ultimate mind-bending road trip destination? Here, you can watch objects and cars roll uphill, like they're stuck in some kind of magnetic vortex. It's an optical illusion that occurs thanks to the sneaky slopes and general layout of the area. The road might look like it's going uphill, but it's actually a downhill road in disguise, playing tricks on your brain like a mischievous magician. You might also see your car moving by itself in the neutral gear. No, your car isn't haunted. It's just basic physics at work. Even when the engine is off, the wheels can still turn, thanks to momentum and the subtle slope of the road. Mount Aragats has a similar story to the Magnetic Hill of India. This one, too, is like a magnet for thrill-seekers and car enthusiasts. It's located on the border between Turkey and Armenia. It has a reputation for making cars defy gravity. People from all over the world visit this mountain to witness the incredible spectacle, where a car parked on the slope seems to roll uphill all by itself, without any driver behind the wheel. There's a nearby river that flows uphill too. People who visited this site claim that it's easier to go up than down there. Number six on the list is the Golden Boulder from Myanmar. The rock looks like it's about to tumble down the hill at any moment. But it's not going anywhere. It's been sitting there for over 2,500 years. The rock is the centerpiece of a stunning pagoda that sits on top of it, towering 49 feet above the ground. According to legend, the rock is held in place by none other than a strand of Buddha's hair. It's no wonder that this place is one of the most important Buddhist pilgrimage sites in Myanmar. The rock was chosen by a celestial king who was impressed by a Buddhist monk's incredible asceticism. So, he used his supernatural powers to carefully place the rock in its current spot, where it looked like the monk's head. If that's not enough, it's said that only a woman can move the boulder. That's why women aren't allowed to touch it. So, if you're up for an adventure, head over to this magnificent rock and pagoda and witness this gravity-defying feat for yourself. Back to the U.S. Oregon Vortex is located on Sardine Creek, Oregon. It's a tourist attraction that's been around since 1930. The owners of the attraction claim that it's some paranormal activity, but it's pretty obvious some clever optical illusions are involved. Legend has it that even before the attraction was built, Native Americans in the area warned that this land was forbidden, and horses refused to go there. But then, some gold miners built an assay office there in 1904, and the building ended up sliding to a wonky angle. Now picture this. You're in a cozy spot, away from city light pollution, staring up at billions of stars putting on a sparkling show above you. But if you're lucky enough to be in Marfa, Texas, you'll get a little something extra. Mysterious orbs decide to join in on the fun, shining bright like a diamond, and they've been doing it for over a hundred years. But what are these glowing orbs called Marfa lights? Well, everyone has their own theories. Some people think they're just car lights from the nearby highway, but that's no fun. Others believe that these orbs are actually sentient beings trying to convey some sort of important message to us. Mere mortals. Imagine standing at the edge of a stunning lake, admiring the picturesque view of a majestic volcano. Suddenly, you hear a loud boom and flames shoot up into the air like a firework show gone wild. But don't worry, it's not an eruption, it's just the Kauaijin Lake and volcano doing its thing. This fiery spectacle is caused by a natural phenomenon where sulfuric gases burst through the rocks and ignite upon contact with the outside air. The result? Flames that soar up to 16 feet in height, burning blue like the coolest neon lights you've ever seen. And if that's not enough, the liquid sulfur that streams down the mountain looks like a molten river of electric blue lava. It's equal parts terrifying and breathtaking, and a sight you won't soon forget. Speaking of unforgettable things, the Rachat structure in Mauritania has been an eye-catching enigma for astronauts since the dawn of the NASA space program. This circular feature in Earth's crust was created by a raised dome that was eroded over time, revealing the original flat rock layers. As you move from the center of the structure outward, you travel back in time, as the older rock layers are exposed in the middle. This geological phenomenon is made up of sedimentary and igneous rocks and measures 28 miles across. From space, you can see several faults where the rock layers have shifted and have been pulled apart. The Rachat structure is situated in the heart of the Sahara Desert. 
There you go. This is our version of the top 10. Would you add something else to this list? So, you've just finished your sightseeing tour of Edinburgh, Scotland, or Scotland. It lasted just under an hour, and you're hungry for more. You ask your guide if there's anything else to see, and they start talking about a mysterious underground city. You ask how long it takes to get there, and you're shocked by the guide's answer. You're standing on it. It's right under your feet. South Bridge? But you were just there and didn't notice a giant arrow pointing down. Hmm. So this is where the mystery starts. The story begins in the mid-1700s. The Scottish capital wasn't as big as it is today. Only 60,000 people lived around Edinburgh Castle. All of them were packed inside medieval walls. And they say today's cities are overpopulated. Get a load of the living conditions back then. The buildings were tall, so there was little natural light. Some houses had 14 stories. Cows walked the narrow winding streets and left stuff. Things were so bad that the famous English writer Daniel Defoe noted, I believe that in no city in the world so many people have so little room. Yep, that's the guy who wrote Robinson Crusoe. Well, something just had to be done. The solution was to build two long bridges to the north and to the south of the city. The names they gave the bridges were more descriptive than colorful. The bridge to the north was completed first. In 1785, construction on the second bridge got underway. It was going to connect the main pedestrian street in the north with the university buildings in the south of Edinburgh. But don't think of this construction as a modern bridge over a river. It was more of a viaduct, a type of bridge that connects two hills across a valley. The word viaduct comes from Latin, as Romans were pioneers in building these structures. Their capital was built on seven hills. And just to be copycats, Edinburgh also straddled seven major hills. Only two are visible today because the city has been built up. Now back in the 18th century, the construction of the South Bridge was a remarkable feat of engineering. It took the builders only three years to complete it. 19 stone arches spanned a chasm that was 31 feet at its deepest point, and the length over a thousand feet. Impressive, even for today's standards. But what does a two and a half centuries old viaduct have to do with an underground city? Well, it is the city. You see, they designed Southbridge to be hollow on the inside. As you walk along this street today, there is actually a huge human-made cave beneath your feet. The popular name for this set of chambers is the Edinburgh Vaults. But what was the purpose of this space? And is there something or someone there now? Well, let's take it one step at a time. The builder's original intention was for these vaults to serve as merchant shops. At first, it worked out fine. Merchants used a total of 120 vaults as shops and warehouses. There were workshops, cobblers, and taverns. But as time went by, a major design flaw came to light. The stone was leaking, and the vaults were damp all the time. There was even flooding. The builders forgot to waterproof the structure. The merchants feared the water would damage their precious goods. After just a couple of years, the first tenants started moving out. Once legal trade moved away from the vaults, the city's poor moved in. And not only them, but all sorts of shady characters. Historians don't know much about this period, since there are no written records. But even the squatters had to leave soon. If you couldn't do business in these vaults, how could you live in them? It was damp and cold, and there was no ventilation, sanitation, or natural light. It really stunk. Every real estate agent's worst nightmare. Just 30 years after their completion, the Southbridge vaults were abandoned once and for all. But at a street level, business was as usual. The officials decided to fill the vaults with rubble for security purposes. Buried and forgotten, the memory of a once teeming merchant quarter of Edinburgh slowly faded from people's minds. Now, this is where the story gets a bit weird. During the 1980s, a Scottish rugby player accidentally found a tunnel leading into the vaults. The athlete didn't waste any time and started excavating the vaults with the help of his son. 
Several tons of rubble and, a decade later, the South Bridge vaults have been restored to their former glory, so to speak. They were again dark and damp, as they were back in the 1700s. There were many interesting finds in this underground city. The vaults were littered with oyster shells, which were the standard diet for a working-class resident of Edinburgh at the time. Other finds, such as shoes and empty bottles, suggested that people actually lived in these claustrophobic vaults. Think of this the next time you see someone trying to rent their garage as an apartment. So, your guide was right. There really is a hidden city under the streets of Edinburgh. Well, at least one street. You have now gone down from the main pedestrian street into Cowgate. You look up and there it is, the only visible arch of the once impressive bridge. You are now searching online to book a tour of the vaults. You just have to see this place with your own eyes. But the Scottish capital isn't the only city with a mysterious underground. The historic region of Cappadocia in central Turkey hides no less than 36 cities beneath the ground. The biggest and the most impressive one wasn't discovered until 1963. It was built during the Byzantine era to protect the local population from invaders. We have similar structures made out of concrete in our cities, but the level of the Turkish underground city is really impressive. There are several levels, like in a multi-story car garage. The caves and tunnels lie 197 feet underground. That's two-thirds of the Statue of Liberty's height. The city could house 20,000 people at any given time, complete with livestock and food. Hmm, the smell. Anyway, 20,000 is the average attendance at Major League Soccer matches today. You might want to add a field trip to one of these places the next time you go to Turkey. Most of these cities in Cappadocia can be found in rural areas. Makes sense, right? After all, they were dug out as hiding places. But in Europe, there is one city whose underground labyrinth resembles the vaults of Edinburgh. You've probably heard of Pilsen in the Czech Republic. But hold on a second. This isn't going to be a story of the most famous local product. Something brewed, perhaps? It's the story of a medieval city that survived underneath the streets of Pilsen. Water wells, cellars, and passageways stretch for more than 12 miles. Merchants and craftspeople use Pilsen's historical underground for storage. Water, food, ice, you name it. The waterworks are pretty impressive. Historians estimate that 360 wells are located under Pilsen's historical town center. In times of instability, the passageways served as safe havens for the locals. They definitely didn't go thirsty down there. Today, most tourists visit these mysterious underground cities. But in Canada, there's one where people live and work. The construction of Montreal's underground city began in 1962. The initial idea was to shelter traffic. That's a nice way to say that city officials were building a metro station. The idea caught on, and the project expanded. Now, it's a real-life urban maze hidden under the downtown area. Need a place to stay? There are hotels down there. Want to grab a bite? Step into one of the underground restaurants. Multiple shops, a library, cinemas, the list is long. There are even residential complexes. But how can people live under the ground? Simple. Although the city itself lies beneath the earth, the access points are at ground level. You can enter the 20-mile-long tunnel network at more than 120 places. Oh, that's another place down under. Oops, sorry, Australia. Your geography Mm. teacher must have told you there are seven continents in the world. In 2017, scientists made an announcement that changed this universal truth the discovery of Zealandia. They called for a change in world maps and provided us with some proof, of course. First off, let's take a look at the ocean floor near New Zealand. The continental shelves of this mysterious continent are chilling at a depth of around 3,280 feet below sea level. The nearby oceanic crust dives even deeper at 9,800 feet below that. All of that is giving us those continent vibes with varying altitudes from deep below the ocean to the majestic Mount Cook, standing tall at 12,217 feet above sea level. 
Brave geologists have gone deep down to collect rocks from the ocean floor. They found that unlike the nearby oceanic crust, which is made up of fresh basaltic rocks, the crust around New Zealand is one impressive mix. We're talking granite, limestone, sandstone, and some ancient rock types that are incredibly ancient. All this screams continental crust. Finally, scientists have discovered a narrow strip of oceanic crust that separates Australia from the hidden land of Zealandia. It means these two are separate continents. 85 million years ago, Zealandia decided to break free from the supercontinent Gondwana. Millions of years later, the Earth's tectonic plates, those puzzle pieces that make up our planet's crust, started throwing a wild party. The mighty Pacific Plate, the heavyweight champion of tectonic plates, decided to take a dive beneath Zealandia's continental crust. This process is called subduction. As a result, the root of Zealandia, that connection to its continental crust, broke off and went into the depths below. So you see now that it takes millions of years and a lot of action for a new continent to form. But what if the impossible happened? and a new continent formed overnight in the Pacific Ocean. The next morning, you'd probably spill your morning coffee while watching the news. For this newfound land to be considered a full-fledged continent, it needs to have a surface area like Zealandia and be a large, uninterrupted chunk of land with some water surrounding it. And here comes the twist. The Pacific Ocean has an average depth of 13,000 feet. So, if a continent wanted to join the party, it would have to push a whole lot of rock upward, shaping its way to the surface. A new continent emerging overnight would make sea levels skyrocket. We'd have to say goodbye to geographically low-lying countries like Bangladesh, Senegal, and the Netherlands. The ocean currents would be in for a wild ride too. The North Pacific subtropical gyre, a vibrant hotspot for marine life, would be thrown off balance. Those poor marine creatures who rely on the currents for their journeys would need some new source of navigation. Plus, the creatures that live permanently in one place could lose their main food source. Oceans are like global free-for-alls, but with a new continent in play, the countries situated nearby would be willing to stake their claim on this unexpected landmass. This new continent would be a blank canvas no lush landscapes or freshwater sources, just rock and more rock. So if you are dreaming of relocating to this novelty, you have to wait for some serious terraforming to make it habitable. But for now, let's go back to the real new continent of Zealandia. It's actually a microcontinent, which is an official word for a landmass that has separated from a main continent. In our case, it was Antarctica and then Australia. You could say Zealandia is a bit shy, with only up to 7% of its size peaking above the water surface. But it's nearly 70% as large as Australia in total and proudly boasts of two major islands we know and love as New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island. Plus, there are many smaller islets. The largest islands have glaciers, like the famous Tasman Glacier on the South Island. Thanks to some glacial action in the past, Zealandia can show off its fjords and valleys. New Caledonia has a tropical vibe with its Oceania and South Pacific connections. The unofficial eighth continent is a hotspot for geological action. Part of it belongs to the Australian plate, while the rest rides the Pacific plate. It has six major areas with active volcanoes. And don't forget the geothermal treats, geysers and hot springs are scattered all over the place courtesy of the Australian and Pacific plates having a steamy interaction. The underwater world of Zealandia is a treasure chest of mineral deposits and natural gas fields. It's also a scientific playground. During those icy glacial periods, sea levels dropped and more of Zealandia emerged from the depths. The fossils this process left behind are like an encyclopedia of valuable clues about the life that thrived here during ancient times. The search for Zealandia lasted for 375 years. It all started in 1642, when Dutch seafarer and explorer Abel Tasman set on a mission from Jakarta, Indonesia. Back in the day, 
Europeans were sure that there had to be a massive land down under to balance out their own continent up north. They even had a fancy name for it, Terra Australis. Tasman was determined to become the first to find it. He went west, then south, then east, all the way to the South Island of New Zealand. But here's where things took a turn for the worst. The local Maori people, who had been living there for centuries, didn't exactly roll out the red carpet. They rammed one of Tasman's small boats, and sadly, four of the Europeans met their ends. What happened next remains a mystery. But a few weeks later, Tasman sailed back home without ever stepping foot on this mysterious land he believed to be the great southern continent. He never came back. The explorer didn't even realize that he was actually right all along about the existence of a missing continent. And you already know it only became official in 2017. Another lost and found continent isn't hiding in the ocean, but under Europe. It's called the Greater Adria, and it collided with Europe and started to sink under it around 140 million years ago. Today, it lies beneath Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Its size and even shape match that of Greenland, the world's largest island. Greater Adria is no longer visible, but it left some clues. Parts of it were embedded in the Alps. Other chucks were incorporated into present-day Italy and Croatia on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. Limestone rocks from the former continent started to change once they were under the European landmass. Tremendous heat and pressure spread over tens of millions of years changed their structure. Out goes the limestone, in comes the marble. All the Greek and Roman temples you admired on your summer vacation were constructed using this marble. It was sort of a going away gift from a long lost continent. You don't notice this, but our planet never stops moving and it happens deep beneath our feet. 120 million years ago, Australia and Antarctica were a single piece of land. They went their separate ways, but Antarctica didn't leave empty-handed. Today, there is an oceanic plateau in the Indian Ocean. Long ago, it was connected to another lost continent, the Kerguelen microcontinent. Scientists believe that it made a land bridge between India and Antarctica. To find out what it was like, we can look at a tiny archipelago in the southern Indian Ocean. These islands are all that is left of the ancient landmass. They have a cold climate and feature glaciers because they're so close to Antarctica. But in the past, the climate must have been temperate with plenty of rainfall. The animals and plants would have been similar to those that we find in tropical regions today. The lost continent landscape was probably much like that of New Zealand. Our planet keeps changing, and at some point, all the continents will reconnect with each other forming one supercontinent again. And maybe then, future humans will wonder, what if our continent broke into pieces tomorrow? So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? they tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano, and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, The eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, 
the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster. Park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington state in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. 
something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. The ground shakes beneath you. The pictures rattle on the walls. You hear a rumble off in the distance. Then, boom, a deafening explosion. The shockwave blasts through the windows and sets off car alarms. You duck under the dining table for cover, but then you remember you live not far from a supervolcano in the middle of a tropical jungle. So staying in one place isn't a good idea. The shaking finally halts. You take this chance to peek outside and see a giant cloud of smoke covering the sky. It's lunchtime, but you wouldn't know it. The sun is completely veiled and darkness falls. The power's out in the whole city. In this darkness, you see red molten lava shooting from the sky and spilling on the rim. You run outside along with dozens of your neighbors. Your priority right now, find safe shelter and fast. You think about taking the car, but with everyone running on the road, that's a no-go. So you run on foot where the crowd is going. Super volcanoes are in a league of their own when it comes to natural disasters. Surprisingly, it's not all about size or height. A volcano is dubbed super if it erupts more than 240 cubic miles of magma. That's more than enough to overfill Lake Erie. It must also have a history of erupting and a magnitude of 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The largest active volcano on Earth is Hawaii's Mauna Loa. It's so big, it would cover the entire state of Rhode Island plus some. And next time you see a commercial plane flying high in the sky, remember that 30,000-some-foot altitude is about as tall as Mauna Loa is from base to summit. It's technically taller than Everest when you measure it like that, yet it's not considered a supervolcano. So you're running along the dark road not knowing and barely seeing where to go. 
Then, all of a sudden, a massive flaming boulder smashes through the bridge in front of you. You and everyone else are now stranded on the side of the volcano, as it's getting more chaotic each second. Most of the crowd disperses, finding their own ways to safety. You remember there's a way to the other side not many people know about. But you'll have to cross a raging river through the dense jungle. You calm what's left of the crowd, and everyone follows you to your secret getaway. You finally get out of the city limits and head into the jungle. With the sky already dark, the tall trees and thick leaves make it almost pitch black. Everyone gets out their phone flashlights to navigate through the dark path. You all need to stick together and make sure nobody gets lost. Suddenly, fiery rocks strike the trees not far from you. Everyone jolts and tries to rush ahead. But nowhere is safe when it's raining scalding fire all around. You and your group have to pick up the pace or else. Imagine a typical avalanche or mudslide. Very dangerous situations on their own. Now, imagine an avalanche of lava rocks and lava sliding down a mountain instead of mud. That's what's making its way towards you right now. More and more people catch up with your group and bring news that the entire neighborhood is submerged in lava. It's traveling quicker than you thought. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can move slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous problem. If you didn't have protection, the gases spewing from the eruption would fill your lungs, and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Your eyes and throat would be itchy. You'd get a headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing. The worst would be passing out from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, everyone managed to grab their gas masks before leaving their homes. You're now entering the treacherous terrain of the jungle and the danger zone. Everyone's phone batteries are giving out one by one, so your vision is even more limited. The terrain is tougher, and you can't hear any sounds from the river. At this point, you're not even sure if you're going the right way. But your instincts tell you the deeper you go, the safer you'll be. The path is muddy, and the vines are hindering everyone's movements. That's when you hear something big running through the jungle. It's coming up on you fast. You can't see a thing until it's right up on you. A bear! And there goes a rhino! Wild cats, domestic cats, dogs, different creatures of all sizes and species they all come running through the jungle right past you. You and your fellow humans aren't the only ones fleeing from the eruption. The rumbling is still going on. Before you know it, a shower of fire rocks strikes right behind you and ignites parts of the jungle. There's no going back. Everyone picks up and runs for it. You hear thunder in the distance. A flash of lightning lights up the dark sky. You think, finally, some rain to wash away this fiery nightmare. But that's not a regular storm brewing. These giant smoke clouds can mimic a thunderstorm under similar conditions. Your luck finally pays off. You hear the river straight ahead. You reach the bank and have to hop on some stones to get to the other side. You almost slip when someone from the group catches you just in time. Whew, that was too close. Not far down the river is a large waterfall leading straight to a shallow lake with sharp rocks at the bottom. The ash from the lava falls like snow, covering most of the trees and landing on the river. Ash is one of the most dangerous things about volcanic eruptions. You're soaked to the bone, but it's a lot better than ash and smoke. And then the rest of the group follow. The next thing you know, the river starts steaming as lava meets the bank and runs into the water. You try your best to speed things up. The lava can heat this water up to dangerous levels and there are still people slowly crossing the river on the slippery rocks. Luckily, you manage to get everyone across. Well, almost everyone. You turn around and see someone's leg got caught between two rocks. The lava continues to pour into the river. You can feel the heat of the steam. You rush back to this person and try to pull them out. Their leg won't bud. Someone else from the group comes to help, and you're finally able to pull them out in the nick of time. You and everyone else, now exhausted from your trek, keep going as far as possible. That's when you see the main road that connects you to the broken bridge. 
There are others on the road that got out safely, and even some cars filling up with survivors and heading fast out of the area. The volcano is still spewing lava, and the entire city is flooded with it. What was once your town now looks like a giant burning lake. Planes and helicopters can't fly because of the smoke and ash, so don't count on an air rescue. You're still at risk even though you're on safer ground, so it's still too early to celebrate. Everyone continues to move away from the city. The further, the better. The ground continues to shake, but this time it's even more intense than before. Supervolcanoes are powerful enough to cause many earthquakes. But it's a good thing you're out in the open far from the buildings and debris in the city. Now, back to reality. Rest assured that a volcanic eruption of this intensity won't happen for a very long time, as in millions of years. Besides, thanks to warning systems and humanity's preparation for such an event, it's extremely rare for even a regular volcano to do as much damage as it could. So don't scratch Yellowstone off your travel list just yet. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, 
they realized the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees. But at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks can live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly 
But some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame and electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Los Cantar Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day, making it way more dramatic and monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran 
has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic, with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called a sueda salsa dwells in the saltwater. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity, out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the Dragon Tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world. The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity a human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. It happened in Iceland on Friday, March 19, 2021, 
at 8.45 p.m. About 20 miles southwest of the capital, molten rock suddenly burst through the surface from below. Bright lava fountains then lit up the night sky. A volcano in this valley finally woke up after almost 800 years of sleeping soundly. We divide volcanoes into three categories – active, dormant, or extinct. Around 1,900 of them around the globe are considered active. That means they've erupted in the recent past and will likely do it again in the possible near future. Dormant volcanoes haven't popped off for a long time, but they still may in the future. You could say they're sort of sleeping. As for extinct ones, those guys haven't done anything in more than a million years. The eruption in Iceland wasn't super explosive. And this all happened six miles from the nearest town. So everyone was perfectly safe. Many even came to see it up close. While other brave visitors tried to fry eggs and bacon on the lava. Just be careful not to burn your breakfast black. Lava can be over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It burns everything in its path. Yet it also produces some of the most fertile land for agriculture. This eruption gave a relatively small amount of lava at first. But it's been spreading across the valley in different directions, forming a sort of shield that's constantly growing. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can ooze slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous thing about volcanoes. That would be the toxic gases spewing from the eruption. And those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Luckily, in Iceland's case, the wind has been blowing these gases away from residential areas. Scientists weren't surprised this volcano erupted. They knew it was coming. Increasingly stronger earthquakes had been shaking this area for the past 15 months. There were 50,000 earthquakes within just the three weeks leading up to the eruption. That's 100 per hour. The volcano has been active since March, and geologists say this could last for weeks, months, years, or even decades of constant eruptions in the area. Mount Shasta is in the top five most dangerous volcanoes in the U.S. So geologists are keeping a close eye on it. The last eruption was in 1250. I wasn't around then. But this volcano erupts every 600 to 800 years. Which means, tick-tock, we're due any day now. About an hour from Portland, Oregon, there's an active volcano that last erupted in the 19th century. Next time it goes off, scientists think it'll produce larger amounts of ash and dust. This could cause an electrical blackout and make water unsafe to drink in the area. But the experts pay close attention to Mount Hood. They'll be able to give plenty of warning so people can react in time. Kilauea is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's been erupting almost constantly since 1983, making it also one of the longest eruptions known on Earth. It's the youngest land volcano in Hawaii. Volcanoes can take thousands of years to form, but others can pop up practically overnight. A volcano in Mexico just erupted in an open field in 1943 and started growing from there. Within a year, it was almost 1,500 feet tall. When the eruptions finally stopped nine years later, the mount had reached a height of over 9,200 feet. Mount Fuji is an iconic symbol of Japan. The last time it erupted was in 1707, and it sent a shower of burning rocks as far as 60 miles away. If a similar eruption happened today, Tokyo would be within that vicinity. Mount Fuji is right on the Ring of Fire, that horseshoe-shaped region in the Pacific Ocean full of active volcanoes and earthquakes. From one end to the other, it's almost 25,000 miles long. It could wrap all the way around the Earth's equator. In January 2020, a tall volcano in the Philippines started spewing lava, sending huge plumes of ash half a mile up into the sky. The eruption even triggered a rare phenomenon – a dirty thunderstorm. 
That's when the smoke cloud above a volcano produces its own lightning. The chance of volcanic tsunamis was also high. Those are usually caused by tectonic movements that occur because of volcanic activity. Tall has erupted more than 30 times in the last 450 years. This volcano in Ecuador last erupted in 2016. Scientists think it might be showing some early warning. travels faster and further than the stuff coming out of most volcanoes. It's certainly not amongst the tallest ones, but Ethiopia's Erta Ali is unique in that it has a lava lake almost constantly, which is pretty rare. The locals call it a smoking mountain because its lava lake often causes eruptions. This volcano is near the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on our planet. Marupi has been erupting on a regular basis since the mid-16th century. This volcano helps scientists do crucial research on how eruptions work and how they can warn people in time. After it was dormant for a while, this volcano in central Mexico sprang back to life in 1994. Ever since then, it's been producing huge mud flows and strong explosions in unpredictable intervals. In the past, enormous eruptions coming from this giant buried entire cities in pyramids. Imagine staying in a hotel and waking up to the magnificent view of a massive volcano covered in glowing rivers of lava and clouds of ash. When it lets off heat, visitors to this area in Guatemala take a chance to roast some marshmallows there. One of the most active volcanoes on Earth is on a small island north of Sicily. Stromboli has regular explosions, together with glowing lava coming from vents inside the crater. Not too far away is Etna, Europe's most active volcano and one of the biggest continental ones in the world. By the way, Earth definitely isn't the only planet with volcanoes. The largest one in our solar system is on Mars. It would cover the entire state of Arizona, and it rises nearly three times higher than Mount Everest. Ooh, don't look down. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, 
you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So, I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway. Remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit, because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. 
Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. So imagine being one of the first people sent to explore Mars. As you're approaching the red planet, something strange and creepy draws your attention. There, yes, right there. Doesn't it look like a mammoth bear's head? What or who could possibly create a bear snout in the middle of a crater? Unfortunately, or should I say luckily, there's nothing mysterious about the bear's head. It's just a facial pareidolia. That's a tendency to see facial features in everyday things. Hmm, but speaking about the finding on Mars, should we rename the phenomenon into Beridolia? You could see that coming, couldn't you? Alright, check it out. You see a V-shaped hill that looks like a nose. Then there are two craters that look like eyes. And then there's a circular fracture pattern, the head, that surrounds the nose and the eyes. Experts think that the face could be created when a deposit was settling over a buried impact crater. And the nose might be a mud or volcanic vent with solidified lava or mud flows around it. 
Anyway, the crater does look like a bear's face, I'll give you that. But thanks to HiRISE, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, another of NASA's amazing acronyms, we've seen many other crazy craters on the red planet. Like smiley faces, a bird, or an elephant. First, let's have a look at the famous face of Mars. These images were first taken by the Viking Orbiter in 1976. At that time, the resolution was obviously quite poor, plus the lighting was slanted which produced the result that shocked people in the 1970s – a face carved of rock staring back at Earth. Did it mean there was another civilization on Mars that had created this monument? Nah. Look at the photo of the same spot taken by the current Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The resolution is much, much better, and the face has miraculously turned into an ordinary hill. Or look at this teeny Bigfoot, whose image was captured in 2008. I say teeny because this creature is just a few inches tall. And when the photo was taken, Bigfoot was only several yards away from the camera. And here, one curious soul zoomed in on a small rock and spotted something that resembled a gorilla. That's how some people started to believe there were apes on Mars. Yeah, really. Let me show you some more examples of imaginary creatures and faces on the red planet. Most of them come from a series of images taken by the Themis camera. Currently, it's on board the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which only needs two hours to orbit the red planet, carrying some important scientific instruments. Let me introduce my happy Martian to you. This two-mile-wide crater was photographed in 2008. The next crater chain looks like a wasp with its wispy wings of impact debris. The whole feature was probably created by a meteorite that fell at a very low angle and broke into pieces right before the impact. Now, do you see a woolly mammoth or an elephant here? Lava flows in one region on Mars left this image on its reddish soil. The region itself, called Elysium Planitia, is famous for the planet's youngest lava flows. For example, the one that looks like a mammoth most likely formed in the past 100 million years. Eh, just yesterday. Now let's talk about love. Or rather, its symbol, the heart. Do you like these two hearts on the surface of the red planet? This one is actually a mesa top outlined by frost. And this heart shape is an impact crater. The hit tore away dark surface material and exposed lighter soil underneath. Then some of the material probably flew downslope, creating the heart. And this dust-covered hummingbird. Can you see its long beak and head? Scientists aren't sure how this shape was formed, but they think erosion and wind played a part in its creation. These dark sand dune deposits look like a howling wolf. And here, can you see a series of interlocking gears? This image looks like the letter T, right? The right angle fracture was created by the tectonic stretching of the Martian crust. Do you think we might find other letters of the alphabet on Mars too? Why not? And now, how about another bizarre thing astronomers noticed on the surface of Mars? Is that a door to someone's house? It was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. It became viral because this formation over here, see, looks like a door. Unfortunately, scientists, due to their rational minds, were quick to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There were several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, the opening is tiny, a mere 3 feet high. They're sure that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. If you look at the rock closely, you may notice strata. Those are layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And look at this! See those cracks? That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight. And this created the door-shaped opening. This theory is quite plausible, because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago. But it's not only the red planet that can boast of having unusual formations. Let's take this comet, for example. 
This image was taken by the European spacecraft Rosetta in 2014. Can you see a face on its right-hand side? Or the moon? Here's its famous rabbit. It sits upside down, with its ears pointing downward. Some people see a man on the moon. It can either be his face or the entire body. If someone sees the whole human figure, it usually looks like it's carrying sticks. Sometimes, it's a toad. To spot it, look at the top left-hand side of our moon. The toad is facing upward, see? Now, look at this spinning neutron star. Such a star is a collapsed core of a supergiant star with a total mass of 10 to 25 solar masses. Except for black holes and some hypothetical objects, like quark stars or white holes, neutron stars are the densest and smallest known stellar objects. Anyway, back to this particular star. As you can see, this space object, located 17,000 light-years away from Earth, is surrounded by a cloud of energetic particles. And this image, taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, appeared in 2009 and became viral in no time. All because many people spotted a hand-like structure among all that space stuff. NASA explained that the star was spinning incredibly fast, spewing energy into the space surrounding it. This created intriguing and complex structures, like the large cosmic hand so many people see. Now, look at the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation Orion. This is a freezing cold and dark cloud of dust and gas that was first noted in 1888. This dark shadowing is created by dust. And at the base of the nebula, there are many bright spots. Those are young stars at the stage of formation. Pay attention to this extremely bright star in the top left side of the horse head. Its radiation is so powerful that the star is starting to erode the cloud around itself. It means that, in millions of years, the nebula might not resemble the head of a horse anymore. Well, I won't be around then. The European Southern Observatory Very Large Telescope has captured an image in which we can see the collision of three different galaxies. We can even observe the effect they have on each other. But the coolest thing is that, while colliding, they created a recognizable shape. Because doesn't it look like a giant space hummingbird? About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Mm. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Verita Fort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. 
1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best-preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds, but no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. 
It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba Crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. Our Sun Scenario 1 Something strange just happened now! Every TV channel, the news, they're all talking about a black hole that came closer to us, on the spot where our sun used to be. You can even see an accretion disk, and the background of the sky looks kind of distorted, which means it got really close. Normally, black holes are so far away that we can't see them with the unaided eye. You can't even see them with a telescope directly. What's it doing here so close? And where's the sun? Did the black hole swallow it? The sun used to be in the center of our solar system, far enough not to burn us, but still close enough to give us light, warmth, and beautiful scenes when it rises in the east and goes to rest in the west. Hey, this one even rhymes. <laughs> well, it gave us life. The most massive body in our solar system contains 99.8% of its total mass. It's so wide, you could fit more than a million Earths inside of the sun. Maybe our sun turned into a black hole. But it's way too early for that to happen. I mean, that's how they form, when enormous stars come to the end of their life cycle and explode, which is called a supernova. They end up collapsing on themselves, becoming very small. It's a tiny size and a huge mass. That's what makes black holes' gravity so strong, and even light that comes too close can't escape. And all the stars in the universe are shrinking, and will disappear at some moment. Our sun loses 4 million tons of mass every second, and eventually, the only energy left in the universe will be generated by black holes. A black hole is surrounded by dust, gas, and radiation. The radiation is very dangerous, so we hope our planet won't come near it. Our solar system doesn't have light anymore. No light and no heat either, so even Mercury and Venus will probably get covered in ice pretty soon, not to mention Earth. Do I need to say nothing will survive this new ice age? The only salvation might come from the accretion disk that spins so fast it generates heat, but that's too many chances to take. Still, at least if the black hole has the same exact mass as the sun before it, all the planets will remain in the same orbits, Earth included. But if it has a mass bigger than our sun, which is something our scientists are currently trying to figure out, then bye-bye, solar system. It was nice knowing you. Scenario 2 Oh no, what's happening? It was supposed to be a nice sunny day, but now you see darkness descending so abruptly. How come it's night, yet the clock says it's 2 p.m., and the moon looks different? The TV reports say our sun is gone, and due to some mysterious events, the moon is not orbiting the Earth anymore. It's in the center of our solar system now. We don't have much time left. Since the sun is not in the center of our solar system, we now have 8 minutes and 20 seconds to become aware of it. It may take millions of years for the sun's energy to travel from its core to the surface, but 8 minutes and 20 seconds is exactly how long it takes for sunlight to reach Earth. The light takes a journey across 93 million miles, which is the distance that separates us from the sun. We're not in the habitable zone anymore. The habitable zone is the distance from a star in our case, the sun, at which liquid water could exist on the surface of a planet. Now that the sun's gone, its light won't reach us anymore, and our planet will gradually become a frozen, lifeless rock. Who knows if we'll have enough time to come up with some technologies that would provide us with the solar energy we need to sustain life on Earth. If not, well, millions or billions of years later, scientists from some other civilizations would explore it, trying to find evidence if life ever even existed there. It would be the same as we do with Mars and other planets in our solar system, trying to figure out if they've always been lifeless or if there might be a sign that some organisms used to live there. Something else, also vital for our life, travels at the speed of light. Gravity. Without the sun, for roughly eight more minutes, the planets would continue circling the empty center of our solar system until the clock ticks 
and they finally drift somewhere into an unknown direction of outer space. Our moon doesn't have a strong enough gravity to keep us in place. It can't shine so brightly to give us warmth and support life. It's so far, we can barely see it now. Without the moon that peacefully travels close to our planet as it used to, we can see tides are getting lower incredibly fast. Oh, and it's becoming really windy. Winds are so much stronger and faster now. When things were normal, our planet sat at a 23.5 degree tilt, which is the reason we had changing weather and seasons. Now the tilt is so extreme, it's getting very cold very fast. And our time is almost up. People are screaming, everyone's in panic. We still have maybe one minute left until we sink into eternal darkness. Scenario number three. We're not sure what exactly happened and how the life we carelessly lived yesterday came to an end. No one could predict it, but it seems that out of nowhere, a giant neutron star took the spot where our sun used to be. It's not something we'd recognize on our own. We just noticed something was different and the sun kind of got smaller and weirder. The rest we heard on the news and no one knows how it happened. Maybe our sun is somewhere behind the neutron star or the star pushed it out of our solar system and into an unknown direction. A neutron star is the densest space object we know about. It has almost twice as much mass as our sun, but it's all squeezed into a star only 10 miles, 15 kilometers across, which is about the size of a city on Earth. A neutron star forms when a huge star runs out of fuel. It collapses in a big explosion. Its very central region, the core, collapses, which is why every electron, negatively charged particle, and proton, positively charged particle, crush together into a neutron which is either uncharged or neutrally charged. We're in a very tricky situation now, basically waiting for our end to come. This neutron star has gravity 2 billion times stronger than the one Earth has. This means our new sun will pull all the planets in our solar system towards itself and eventually destroy them. It's already started. For the first time that we know of, the planets are leaving their stable orbits, attracted by the powerful force of the neutron star. It's becoming chaotic pretty fast. And it won't stop there. A neutron star rotates more than 700 times every second, which is incredibly fast. Our sun rotates once every 27 days. So after it destroys all the planets, including us, this star will continue whirling throughout the universe at about one fifth the speed of light. Maybe it will slow down and fizzle out with time, but maybe not. After thousands of years, many neutron stars begin to slow down and blow out. But that doesn't always happen. If it meets another star, it will orbit it and start to feed off its atmosphere until it collapses at some point and turns into a giant black hole. Eh, our sun was going to burn out anyway. Until the neutron star showed up, the sun was 4.6 billion years old, which was about halfway through its lifespan. It had already burned off about half of its hydrogen stores and had enough supplies for another 5 billion years. It was eventually supposed to end up the size of the Earth. After running out of fuel, it would have simply collapsed. It would have retained its enormous mass, but its volume was going to be similar to that of our planet. No sun, no life. So the result would have been basically the same. But this way, it would have been a slow process. Who knows if humans would even inhabit this solar system in those times. But with neutron stars, things move towards the end pretty quickly, and it's way more chaotic. If the neutron star was going crazy somewhere far away in another galaxy, we'd only see it in the shape of a distant flashing light that we call a pulsar. But this way, boom! Colonizing other planets is like the ultimate cosmic adventure. It's a challenge that's captured the imagination of humans for centuries, and it's something we've always dreamed of doing. One of the most popular candidates for this role is Mars. And this isn't surprising. Mars is a rocky planet that is similar to Earth in many ways. And it even has evidence of water on its surface. This makes it a prime candidate for human colonization. Many scientists and engineers are working on plans to send humans to Mars and establish a permanent settlement there. But what about the other candidates? There are many planets and moons in our solar system, so why not colonize something else? For example, Ceres. 
Ceres is the ultimate cosmic treasure trove. It's a dwarf planet, not a full-fledged one, just like Pluto. It's located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This dwarf planet is the closest to the Sun, and it's adorably tiny. The entire planet is about the same size as the state of Texas. So why choose it? Because Ceres may be a rich source of valuable resources. The surface of Ceres is covered in craters and other geological features. And scientists believe that beneath its surface, it has a thick layer of water ice. Which means that deep underground, it may have an ocean of liquid water. If this is true, Ceres could be a valuable resource for future space missions. It could potentially provide a source of water for human exploration of the solar system. So, can we colonize it? And if so, how do we do that? Actually, many scientists and space enthusiasts have proposed this idea. To colonize Ceres, we'd have to use the same methods used to establish colonies on the Moon, Mercury, and the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Don't worry, it's not that hard. We just need to figure out how to adapt to a very thin atmosphere, to extreme temperatures and pressure and, well, all the other nasty stuff. But let's stay hopeful. At the end of the day, it all comes down to resources. We'll need water, minerals, silica, and other raw materials. All this would help us to create a self-sufficient colony. And luckily, Ceres is full of these things. So first of all, we could locate the places of residence inside the craters of Ceres. We could build domes there that would protect us from all sorts of dangerous things, like radiation. We could also mine regolith in the asteroid belt. Regolith is a residual soil that appears as a result of cosmic weathering of the rock. Basically, it's something like the surface layer of soil on the moon. Why do we need it? Well, because we could use it to 3D print the base layers next to the ice, so that our bases would be located near the water. We could then use these base layers to print other structures, like houses. We could also collect ice and organic molecules to create water. And by combining water with regolith, we would get soil in which we could grow plants and food. Wonderful! There's also another option. A colony could be created underground. That is, right next to the icy crust of the planet. Now, if in the future we'll be some kind of super cool scientists, we could try to accelerate the rotation of Ceres, which sounds crazy, but would be pretty beneficial. It would help us to create artificial gravity inside the underground colonies. And speaking of gravity, all of these things may sound cool, but let's discuss the difficulties that lie ahead of us during colonization. To colonize Ceres, we would need to overcome a number of challenges. To begin with, we need to develop technologies that will help us even get to Ceres. We need some kind of ships that would be capable of long flights into deep space. For them, first we need to create some kind of nuclear thermal or nuclear electric traction, and maybe an even more advanced type of fuel. Then we'll also need technology to help us sustain life in this small rocky world. That is, tools to extract and use local resources. Also, since there's no atmosphere on Ceres, we would have to wear spacesuits and live in pressurized habitats. And this is only the beginning. Living on the planet itself won't be an easy task either. For example, what about extreme temperatures, or radiation, or the mentioned incredibly weak gravity? The latter is definitely one of the biggest problems. The gravity of Ceres is only 3% of the Earth's. You wouldn't want to accidentally fly into outer space while playing football, would you? But the fact that any jump could send you on an endless journey isn't the only problem. Even if you somehow stay on the surface of the planet, you'll experience the same symptoms and problems as astronauts who hang out on the International Space Station. For example, loss of muscle mass, decrease in bone density, deterioration of vision, problems with the cardiovascular system. Wow. Who would have thought that gravity is so important? 
So therefore, if we wanted to survive on Ceres, we would need either a bunch of doctors or some kind of artificial gravity. And don't even get me started on how low gravity will slow down production and work. And of course, we can't go anywhere without discussing money. Colonizing Ceres would cost us a huge expense, especially taking into account all of the above. And yet, despite all these things, Ceres still stays one of the best candidates for colonization. For example, Ceres contains lots of methane and ammonia. They can be used as a manufactured fuel or a nitrogenous gas. Or you can just mine it there in order to colonize Mars and Venus. Even low gravity has its advantages. Thanks to it, it will be very easy to launch spacecraft from Ceres. We'll waste much less fuel, which means that transportation from Ceres to other planets would be much cheaper and more efficient. So, even if Ceres doesn't become our permanent residence, it can become a good transport hub, something like a spaceport. We could use it as a base for mining all sorts of useful things from the asteroid belt. Then, we could transport all these resources back to Mars or Earth. And it can also become a refueling station for ships traveling further beyond the solar system. Sounds cool and pretty sci-fi-ish, doesn't it? But it seems that any attempts to create a permanent base in the asteroid belt will have to wait. Colonizing other planets is a difficult and complex task. It'll require the cooperation and expertise of many different people, and it will involve developing new technologies and overcoming many challenges. Before we go to Ceres, we need to build infrastructures on the Moon, Mars, and somewhere in between. Otherwise, any attempts to colonize it would be prohibitively expensive and would most likely fail before future missions could even reach it. But the more colonies we create, the more likely it is that sooner or later, we'll build another one on Ceres. This would not only open the asteroid belt to economic exploitation, it would also serve as a stepping stone to the outer solar system. This, in turn, could lead to colonizing the moons of Jupiter and beyond. In other words, the rewards of colonizing Ceres could be great. Not only would it allow us to explore and understand this fascinating world, but it could also provide us with valuable resources that could help us to further explore and settle the solar system. Life on Ceres would likely be challenging, but exciting, as humans would be making a new home for themselves and exploring the mysteries of the universe. Just imagine all the new planet-themed restaurants and shops we could have. Welcome to Ceres Mart, where everything is out of this world! So, if you're a fan of cosmic treasure hunts, Ceres is surely a rich and rewarding destination. Just make sure you bring some weights on your feet, so you don't fly anywhere. Hold on to your space helmets, because NASA's Curiosity rover has just stumbled upon the wildest rock formation ever. And on April Fool's Day, isn't that just the weirdest coincidence? The device captured some images with some rocks that look like dragon bones. Now, let me take you back to 2012 when Curiosity made its grand entrance on Martian soil. It was like the queen bee of rovers, the biggest and most capable one at the time. And boy has it been making waves since then. It's even discovered evidence of water and organic molecules on Mars. These findings were giant leaps in our quest to find out if Mars ever had its own little creatures. But hey, Let's not forget that Curiosity is no spring chicken anymore. It's been trotting around Mars for a solid 11 years, and its heyday may have come and gone with the launch of the shiny new Perseverance rover. Nevertheless, Curiosity still manages to capture our imagination with its knack for spotting familiar-looking rocks. From objects shaped like fish backbones to ones that resemble traffic lights, Curiosity has given us plenty to marvel at. But now the internet is exploding with excitement over the jaw-dropping images from Curiosity's masked camera. People are going bonkers over what can only be described as dragon bones. One astrobiologist acknowledged we've seen our fair share of weird-looking objects on Mars. But this one exceeded all expectations. The current theory is that these unique ripples on the structure were formed after a whole lot of erosion, probably caused by the Martian winds. Now, you might be thinking, okay, cool, but what's the big deal about a funky rock? Well, for starters, 
It's a reminder of just how much we still have to uncover about our mysterious red neighbor. While we're gazing over potential dragon bones and daydreaming about interplanetary adventures, curiosity has its serious hat on. Its main mission is to gather as much data as possible and figure out if Mars was ever a cozy home for teeny tiny microbial life forms. It isn't the first time our trusty Curiosity rover has stumbled upon something truly out of this world. Our robotic explorer buddy has also given us a peek at a teeny tiny rock on the red planet. It bears an uncanny resemblance to a fossilized book. Can you imagine stumbling upon a Martian library? On the 3,800th Martian day of its mission, our adventurous rover captured an intriguing snapshot of this unusual discovery. Using its nifty Mars hand lens imager attached to its robotic arm, Curiosity snapped a pic of this rock that looks like it's been plucked straight from a librarian's wildest dreams. Before you get too carried away with fantasies of outer space reading materials, let's clarify the dimensions of this rock. While it may resemble a book, it's pint-sized in comparison. In fact, it's only a mere one inch across. So don't go expecting the next Martian bestseller to hit the shelves anytime soon. It's more of a pocket-sized edition, perfect for a quick read during interplanetary commutes. Now before you get too excited about this discovery, do know that NASA officials commented that peculiarly shaped rocks are pretty common on Mars. Also, billions of years of relentless Martian winds have swept away everything except these uniquely shaped remnants. Curiosity has quite the eye for spotting unusual formations. Back in February 2022, our rover pal stumbled upon a mineral flower with branching patterns that looked like it had been styled by a florist. It measured a petite 0.4 inch in width. And just a few weeks later, on February 16th, Curiosity managed to capture some rocky evidence of ancient lakes, featuring teeny ripples and waves frozen in time. If you thought Mars was just a desolate red wasteland, think again. Scientists have even discovered larger scale shapes etched into the Martian surface by ancient water. For instance, there's a rock formation that bears an uncanny resemblance to the adorable face of a teddy bear. Who knew Mars had a cuddly side? And to top it off, there's another rock that looks like the spitting image of the frizzy-haired cartoon character. But curiosity isn't just about oddities and peculiarities. Remember that time on February 2nd when the rover unveiled the first clear images of sun rays on Mars? Picture this. As the sun dips below the Martian horizon during sunrises or sunsets, its rays create a mesmerizing sight as they pierce through gaps in the clouds. It's like Mother Nature's own laser light show. There are even images online with a so-called doorway on Mars. And no, it's not a secret passage for little green Martians to hop in and out of, if that's what you're thinking. The internet went bonkers when Curiosity captured a snapshot that seemed to reveal an object resembling a door. Cue the weird theories and intergalactic excitement, nothing to worry about. As experts have chimed in with a down-to-earth explanation, According to specialists who know a thing or two about Mars geology, this particular structure is most likely the result of natural erosion. Boring answer, I know, but erosion is yet again to blame here. However, some scientists have also chimed in with a dash of humor on the matter. They pointed out that the door stands at a modest height of less than three feet. So even if we were to believe it's a doorway for Martians, we'd have to imagine a particular type of tiny extraterrestrial beings like Martian hobbits. But let's get back to reality, shall we? The consensus among experts is that this door is nothing more than a shallow opening in the rock, cleverly crafted by the forces of nature. Those visible layers were likely deposited around 4 billion years ago under sedimentary conditions, potentially in a river or a wind-blown dune. The winds on Mars have been hard at work, eroding these layers over time, leaving behind the intriguing features we see today. And if you look closely, you'll notice a few natural vertical fractures scattered throughout the image. These fractures are a result of rocks weathering on Mars, and the small cave-like structure we've affectionately nicknamed the door seems to have formed at the intersection of these fractures and the aforementioned layers. It's almost as if a gigantic Martian boulder decided to take a tumble, creating this whimsical cave entrance. There's also a famous Mars crater that's not just your ordinary run-of-the-mill hole in the ground. It's chock full of shiny opal gemstones. According to a cool new study, those mysterious halos of rocks surrounding cracks in the Martian crater might actually be made up of water-rich opal gemstones. Can you imagine that? Mars, the planet of bling. Curiosity yet again came to the rescue 
and did some serious snooping around. It seems there's an ancient, dried-up lake bed on Mars that is teeming with opal gemstones. These objects could be evidence that water and rock have been having a grand old time beneath the Martian surface. Much more recently than anyone had previously thought, that is. Now, when scientists start talking about water, you know they're on the hunt for signs of life. After all, water is pretty crucial for life as we know it. But here's the catch. Water isn't flowing on Mars anymore. So these clever scientists have to put on their detective hats and search for geological signs that water once existed there. What does opal have to do with water on the Martian surface? Well, to make opal, you need rocks with a whole lot of silica and some good old H2O. There's more. Researchers also dove deep into the Curiosity rover's image archive and discovered that these opal-rich halos are not just hanging out in one spot. Nope. They seem to be spread out all over the place in Gale Crater, which is like a huge ancient lake bed. So what did these clever scientists do next? They ran some tests, of course. Using Curiosity's fancy instruments, they confirmed that these light-colored halos do, in fact, contain opal. All this data and those cool fracture halo pictures from earlier in the mission led the researchers to a mind-boggling conclusion. Water must have been hanging out all over Gale Crater for a long time after the ancient lake dried up. This means that life might have existed on Mars and for a bit longer than we'd been guessing. Who knows, maybe even into Mars's modern geological period, which get this started a whopping 2.9 billion years ago. Okay, let's try something together. Open any world map you have available. It can be the one you find in your bookcase or even an online version. Take a look at the vast area covered by water. That's 71% of the Earth's surface. And all that is salt water from the world's oceans. There aren't any borders between the four oceans we've all come to know. But oceanographers and the world's countries did traditionally split these waters into four distinct regions – the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Oceans. And here comes the big surprise. The scientific community has recently recognized the fifth body of water. It's called the Southern Ocean, and three of the four original oceans border it. It circumnavigates Antarctica and the lower portion of the globe and reaches Australia and the southern portions of Africa and South America. What makes this ocean so special? How did the scientific community eventually recognize it? And more importantly, what mysterious creatures does it hide? <laughs> Let's find out! The Antarctic Ocean, or the Southern Ocean, was first mentioned back in 1937 in the second edition of the International Hydrographic Organization's Limits of Oceans and Seas. That's a mouthful. Back then, this organization considered that it was wrong to consider the Antarctic Ocean as its own distinct body of water. Why? Well, because at that time, an ocean was defined as water surrounded by land and not water surrounding land. However, they reconsidered it in 2000 and voted to include this ocean in the official list. They also decided on the name Southern Ocean over the commonly used Antarctic Ocean. Finally, the organization concluded that the ocean should be considered as ending at the 60th parallel south latitude. But how old is this ocean? Well, many specialists believe it to have formed only 30 million years ago, which would make it the youngest of the world's oceans. It was created when Antarctica and South America moved away from each other during the early stages of our planet's development. This unique water current is a distinctive component of the Southern Ocean, as it helps keep the waters flowing around the icy continent. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it moves to the east with incredible speed. It's estimated that it moves an enormous amount of water per second. Some of the disputes regarding the Southern Ocean also have to do with this amazing current. Some specialists believe it separates the water of the Southern Ocean from the waters of the nearing Atlantic or Pacific. Only the rapid circulating water is considered the Southern Ocean. On the other hand, though, a handful of scientists say that the current actually makes the naming issue more complex by not limiting the waters to a specific geographic location. They believe that the waters in the current are different in terms of composition from waters in the northern oceans because they are way colder and have a lot more salt. Sailors don't really like this new body of water, mostly because of the frequent cyclone-like storms that it experiences. 
they happen because of the big temperature difference between the ice packs and the ocean waves. As a result, these storms are very difficult to surpass for any sailors that happen to encounter them. I mean, really, these are the strongest winds found anywhere on our planet. More so, the vessels going through this area must also be wary of the frequent icebergs that may pop up every now and then, and also of the low surface temperatures. Just to paint you a better picture, some of the icebergs found here can span over several hundred meters and can exist all year round, regardless of the season. The latitudes from 50 to 70 have even earned the nicknames of Furious 50s or the Shrieking 60s because of these intense year-round storms. Even the landscape is unique. They say the Southern Ocean has bluer glaciers, colder air, and more intimidating mountains than anywhere else in the world. Now, let's get to the mysterious creatures that call this place home, as thousands of species of wildlife live only here and nowhere else in the world. Let's start with the quirky sea pig, or one of the sea cucumbers as it's sometimes called. There are a lot of them in the waters off Antarctica. Why is it called that way, though? Because of its pink hue and round, bloated looks. On a closer look, it even appears to have a little tail and set of ears, just like a pig. They do help a lot with the quality of the waters here, filtering sand and sediment. Then there are the Hoff crabs that live on the floor of the Antarctic Sea. The Southern Ocean is a cold water environment, but crabs are more adapted to warmer waters. So Hoff crabs gather around the warmth made by volcanic vents. They get the needed warmth and food here. You can find them in large piles, one on top of another, literally filling the space of the vent openings. Now, wonder how they got their unofficial name? Well, it's because of their apparent similarity to the actor David Hasselhoff, whose impressive chest reminded explorers of the crab. Okay. Ever seen a fish that's completely transparent? You'd have to get to these waters down in the south, but they do exist, and they are simply called the ice fish. You can basically see inside them, being completely clear and all. That's because of their see-through skin and because they don't have any red blood cells. Their special power is that they can use antifreeze to prevent their bodies from going solid in the cold waters of the Southern Ocean. Instead of the standard thicker blood, the red one with hemoglobin, ice fish have thinner blood that moves around more easily throughout their bodies, hence giving them the much-needed nutrients and oxygen. Now, is there a monster hidden in these waters? Some people believe this to be the case. And thanks to recent research, we even have video footage of it. Some Australian researchers stumbled upon a bunch of weird-looking creatures that were swimming near the seafloor of the Southern Ocean. This pink blob-like fish seemed to be propelled by a little pair of fins. To quote them on it, it seemed to resemble a chicken just before you put it in the oven. I'm not sure I even want to know what that looks like. It took them some time and research to identify the monster. It's a shy species of sea cucumber, known more by its uh, creative nickname, the Headless Chicken Monster. We've known this creature has existed since the late 1800s, but we've barely ever seen it. And we've only ever captured it on tape once before when it was spotted in the Gulf of Mexico, which is quite far from the waters off the coast of East Antarctica. There's so much we don't know about this creature, like how many of them exist in our waters and how they live, eat, and reproduce. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. But they are one of those penguins that inhabit this specific location and are also the largest species of their kind altogether. What makes them special is that they make their colonies on the sea ice, and most of them never step foot on land. More so, penguin dads lose almost half their weight while incubating the eggs. They're also fascinating swimmers, able to dive deeper and longer than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. We have yet to uncover all the secrets of the mysterious Southern Ocean. But it's clear that it's home to some unique and fragile marine ecosystems. Recognizing it as a new ocean could be one way to focus the public attention on it and help its conservation. When you look at the seas and oceans on a map, you might think that they just flow into each other. 
Like, there's really only one big ocean, and people just arbitrarily gave different names to its different parts. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed at how much more substantial the borders between them actually are. For example, the border between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans is like a literal line between two different worlds. It looks like the two oceans meet at an invisible wall, which does not let them flow into each other and mix their waters. Why on earth does that happen? Obviously, there's no actual invisible wall inside, and water is just water. So what could be interfering with its mixing? Well, the thing is that water isn't just water. There can be different kinds. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans have different densities and chemical makers, the level of salinity and other qualities. One can see by their color that they are far from the same. Borders like this, between two bodies of water with different physical and biological characteristics, are known as haloclines. Jacques-Yves Cousteau discovered one of them while he was deep diving in the Strait of Gibraltar. The layers of water with different solidity looked like they were divided with a transparent film, and each layer had its own distinct flora and fauna. Haloclines appear when water in one ocean or sea is at least five times saltier than in the other. You can create a halocline at home if you pour some seawater or colored salty water in a glass and then add some fresh water on top of it. The only difference is that your halocline will be horizontal and ocean haloclines are vertical. For those of you who are paying attention in chemistry class, you might remember that if you have two liquids with different densities in one space, the denser liquid should eventually end up below the less dense one. By that logic, the border between the two oceans should look not like a vertical line, but a horizontal one. And the difference between their solidity would become less obvious the closer they got to each other. So why doesn't it work like that? Firstly, the difference in density of the two oceans is not big enough for one of them to sink down and the other one to rise up, but it is big enough to not let them mix. Another reason is inertia. There is an inertial force known as the Coriolis force, which influences objects when they are moving in a system of axes, which in turn are moving as well. In simpler terms, the Earth is moving, and all the moving objects on it are carried along, acted upon by this Coriolis force, deviating slightly from their natural course. As a result, the objects on the Earth's surface don't move straight on, but deviate in a curve, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. But because the Earth is moving slowly, after all, it does take the planet a whole day to make a full circle around its axis, the Coriolis effect isn't easy to observe in the short term. It becomes easier to notice only in long-term intervals, like with cyclones or ocean flows. And this is why the direction of flows in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans is different. This difference also doesn't let them mix. Another important difference between these two ocean waters is the strength of molecule connection or surface tensile strength. Thanks to this strength, molecules of the same kind hold on to each other. The two oceans have totally different surface tensile strengths, which also doesn't let them mix. Maybe if the waters were completely still, they could gradually start mixing over time, but as they flow in opposite directions, they just don't have time to do this. We think that it's just water in both oceans, but its separate molecules meet for just a very short moment and then get carried away with the ocean flow. But if you think that it's only the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that don't get along with each other, you are sorely mistaken. There's lots of places on the planet where the waters of the two seas or rivers don't mix, and for even more weird reasons. For example, there's a different kind of border called a thermocline. These are borders between waters of different temperatures, like between the warm water of the Gulf Stream and the much colder North Atlantic Ocean. But the most interesting kinds are called chemoclines. These are borders between waters having different microclimate and chemical makeup. The Sargasso Sea is the biggest and most widely known chemocline. It is a sea within the Atlantic Ocean, which has no shores, but is very obviously distinct. You can't not notice it. Let's now take a look at some other spectacular clines we have on planet Earth. And just as a heads up, I might mispronounce some of these names coming up, so please forgive me. First up, we have the North and Baltic Seas. These two seas meet near the Danish city of Skagen. The water in them doesn't mix because of different densities. 
Sometimes you can see the waves of the two seas clash into each other, making foam. Their waters do mix very, very gradually. That's why the Baltic Sea is slightly saline. If there had been no water coming to it from the North Sea, it would have just been a freshwater lake. Next up, the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. They meet at the Strait of Gibraltar and have both a different density and salinity. So there's two reasons their waters don't mix. Then we have the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The place where they meet is near the Antilles and it's very easy to spot. It looks like someone has painted water with two different shades of blue. Another place where these two meet is Eleuthera Island of the Bahamas. The Caribbean sea water is turquoise and the Atlantic Ocean water is dark blue. There is also the Suriname River and the Atlantic Ocean, which meet near Paramaribo in South America. How about the Uruguay River and its afflux? These two meet in Misiones province in Argentina. One of them is claimed to be used in agriculture, and the other has an almost red tint to it because of loam during rainy seasons. Here's an interesting one. The Rio Negro and the Solimoes Rivers, part of the Amazon River. Six miles from Manaus in Brazil, the Rio Negro and Solimoe Rivers flow into each other, but don't mix for about 2.5 miles. The Rio Negro is dark and the Solimoes is light. They have different temperatures and speeds of flow. Then there's the Moselle and Rhine rivers, which meet in Koblenz, Germany. The water in the Rhine is lighter than that of the Moselle. Okay, how about three different bodies, like the Ilz, Danube, and Inn rivers? The junction of these three rivers is in Passau, Germany. The Ilz is a small mountain river to the left, the Danube is in the middle, and the Inn is a light river to the right. The Inn is wider than the Danube here, but is still its afflux. Take a look at the Alaknanda and Bhagirati rivers, which meet in India. Alaknanda is dark and Bhagirati is light. I really hope I got those right. The Irtish and Ulba rivers flow into each other in Kazakhstan, near the city whose name is Ust Kamenogorsk. The Irtish has clean water and the Ulba's water is cloudy. Moving further east, the Jianling and Yangtze rivers meet in Chongqing, China. I really hope that's close at least. The Jianling is clean and the Yangtze is brown. The Irtish River actually has another intersection with the Om River. These two rivers flow into each other in Omsk, Russia. Here, the Irtish is cloudy and the Om is pure and transparent. Speaking of Russia, the Chuya and Katun rivers meet in the Altai Republic. The water of the Chuya has an unusual cloudy white color here and looks dense and thick. The Katun, by contrast, is clean and turquoise. Flowing into each other, they form a single two-colored stream that does not mix for some time. On the other side of the globe, we have the Green and Colorado Rivers. The place of their junction is National Park Canyonlands in Utah, USA. The Colorado River is brown and the green is, well, green. The corridors of these rivers go through rocks with different chemical makeup. That's why they have such a big contrast of colors. Last but not least, we have the Rhone and Arve rivers. They flow into each other in Geneva, Switzerland. The Rhone is a pure river that flows out from the lakes of Geneva, while the Arve is cloudy and gets its water from the glaciers of the Chamonix Valley. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the strange clients on our beautiful planet, but as you can see, it happens a lot more often than you think. These are the kinds of environmental oddities that can really teach you about the way the natural world works, if you're curious enough, of course. Thanks for watching. Oh, and let me know how well I did with the pronunciations. Constructive feedback is always helpful. Oh, wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean. It seems that the ocean has a leak. But it's not like a leak you would expect, where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's Oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor, but instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. 
When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kind of acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together, which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad, in the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960 and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about four inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia a road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solene. The site of Solene was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. 
Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle. That's a big step because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kinda looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viper fish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. Plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms, maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super dense collapsed stars, or some rare types of supernovae, could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn! How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. 
that shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much, just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T. rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. 
Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in freefall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascaru in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. In 1945, five TBF Avenger aircraft took flight for a routine training exercise around the Bermuda Triangle. In the middle of the exercise, the planes were struck by intense rain and heavy winds, despite the clear weather forecast. The pilots became extremely disoriented and radioed the base to report that their navigational equipment had stopped working. The last thing the base heard was, when the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together, and then static. The five planes and their 14 crew members were never seen or heard from again. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for the many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. No one knows exactly how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. Another bizarre theory trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charlie Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. In the year 1800, a large sailing vessel called the USS Pickering departed from the US on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew and was never heard from again. The USS Pickering was the first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. It's believed that the ship was taken out by a storm, but because no wreckage was ever found, we'll never know for sure. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. 
no trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. An enormous investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. This particular area of the ocean is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. On the ocean floor, decomposing organisms let off large concentrations of methane gas that gets trapped under the water. This gas can build up until, boom, it ruptures. The gas surges up to the surface and erupts. If a ship was in the area of one of these ruptures, the water would become much less dense and cause the ship to sink rapidly and without warning. Scientists believe this could be the cause of the many disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. While this theory makes a lot of sense, it doesn't seem too likely. The U.S. Geological Survey has stated that no large releases of gas are believed to have occurred in this area for the past 15,000 years. The ocean floor is made of rocks containing a lot of magnetite. It's more like iron. Magnetic fields react to high concentrations of magnetite on the ocean floor, which may start a sort of conflict between the two. It can often lead to various weather anomalies and, as a result, navigation issues. And naturally, any changes in the ocean floor or the Earth's magnetic fields influence the Bermuda Triangle a lot. Since the magnetic field is constantly moving, it might be also taking the Bermuda Triangle with it. Now that people know where the triangle is, it's easy to avoid it. It supposedly moves eastward together with the magnetic poles. But scientists still can't answer where exactly it will be in a couple of years. Some people blame all the disasters on the extraterrestrial paranormal activity. Others suppose it's all about raging natural phenomena. There's another triangle in Lake Michigan. Just like the one near Bermuda, the Michigan Triangle got its shady reputation for some disappearances. The first recorded one dates back to 1679. A large vessel, one of the largest of that time, set out on an expedition. Yet, once it got in the sinister triangle, it never came back. Much later, an aircraft disappeared in this triangle. The skies are usually very clear there, but back in 1883, some people witnessed abnormal things in the area. Some claim to have seen large blocks of ice falling from the skies, and the crew even managed to save one as hard proof. Meanwhile, the Pacific Ocean mystery area is another sinister triangle. Off the south coast of Japan, not far away from Tokyo, there's a sea where plenty of ships met their doom, disappearing without a trace in these waters. They call it the Devil's Triangle. Some scientists believe the cause of anomalies is the environmental changes. Also, there's a really high concentration of methane hydrates on the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific Triangle area. You're deviating from your original course and sailing in the wrong direction. There's the Caribbean Sea near the triangle, peppered with small islands. The seafloor here isn't deep. The ship can get in shallow waters. And now the ship is stuck on a shoal, and you have no idea where you are. If this were the 21st century, the ship's captain would be able to reach the shore using GPS and other modern navigation. But the most interesting thing is that the compass would work correctly this time, since the magnetic north pole hasn't already coincided with the true one for a long time in the territory of the Bermuda Triangle. The Agonic Line is somewhere far away from here. There are no problems with navigation now, but for some reason, this is where ships disappear. In fact, not just here. Throughout the Atlantic Ocean, there are places where many more ships were gone. The Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 of such places. One of the main reasons why many ships are lost here is that one of the most popular shipping routes in the Atlantic passes through the Bermuda Triangle. And the more ships in one place, the more shipwrecks. Simple probability. Then, it just starts getting weird. Other theories say that there's a space-time rift in this region. Ships and planes fall into this rift and end up in the past or the future. But for some reason, there's not a single proof of this myth. 
There's no reason to think that the rift is hidden somewhere here. The base of an extraterrestrial civilization is located in the Bermuda Triangle. Visitors from other galaxies steal sea vessels, along with the crew, so no one finds the wreckage of the ships. This is also a popular myth that has no scientific justification. The Kraken lives somewhere in the Triangle. It's a huge squid that sinks ships and also is a legend that sailors tell each other. However, gigantic squids live in the depths of the ocean. They can grow to the size of a half a train car, but no cases have ever been recorded where they sunk a large vessel. And in the area of the Bermuda Triangle, they have never ever been seen. People in the past didn't know about the existence of these creatures. So when they saw them for the first time, they described them as huge, terrible monsters. Giant squids are some of the most elusive creatures on Earth, and scientists had to use sonar equipment to find them. They don't like to leave the dark depths and are likely to be afraid of the sound of any ship. So that should squash the squid as a suspect.